Welcome back. You're watching Late Agenda, and I'm joined now out of the Sky Sydney City studio by Green Senator Lee Rhiannon. Senator, thanks for your company. Hello, Peter. Can I ask you first up, there's been a fair bit of analysis, obviously, as you'd expect in the aftermath of Bob Brown's departure, and, and some of it has touched on this idea that uh, perhaps differences within the Greens are going to come to the fore now, now that the loss of such a significant personality like Bob Brown is gone from that leadership position. Christine Milne is going to hold it hard, to, or find it hard, I should say, to hold together the traditional environmentalists, of which she's classified as one, and the more, if you like, socially activist side of the Greens movement, which you're often affiliated with. How do you respond to that? Oh look, the party, party room's been incredibly cohesive and it seems as though where we disappoint is that um, people, maybe like yourself Peter, who are suggesting there's divisions and even that the Greens, there'll be the demise of the Greens now that Bob's gone. The demise of us has been predicted for a long time and that hasn't happened and right now it's an excellent time for us. Certainly we all have the big shoes of Bob to fill but Christine and Adam Bant, our leadership team, will do that really well. Well, you needed, you needed to read my article on, uh, on Saturday, Senator, because I, I'm not predicting your demise, certainly not imminently anyway. The, the Australian Democrats, I think that the lesson out of that in relation to what happened post-Don Chip was that it actually thrived for quite some time yeah. before it demised. But I think that what a lot of people are wondering is, is whether somebody like Christine Milne or indeed anyone else in the Parliamentary Party can fill the kind of shoes that Bob Brown leaves. As you well know, for small parties, losing a popular charismatic leader is a real challenge. Oh, look, it's certainly a challenge, but if you look at how Friday played out, uh, Bob made the announcement and then the day played out with Christine coming forward, certainly with that clear commitment that she would continue the fine policies that make up the Greens' work and continuing the work that Bob has pioneered. And he has been in many ways ahead of his time, and I'm confident that Christine will continue in that very well courageous style that Bob really um, pioneered. Was it a close vote for the deputies position with Adam Band taking that role? I know that the Greens don't open up internal party matters generally but there was a contest wasn't there? Yes, yes there was a contest um, and Adam is now our deputy leader. I don't have those vote numbers uh, but we've got an excellent team here and uh, Adam's been with me this afternoon, we've been doing some work together so I'm really looking forward to continuing that work. Was there some strategy in putting him into the deputy's role? Because obviously that will help with his profile and in many ways amongst all of the Greens he's in one of the toughest positions trying to hold on to, after all, the only lower house seat that the Greens have. Oh yes, look, it is critical, as you've said, for us to hold on to the seat of Melbourne. So I was really pleased, as I think um, my colleagues in the party room were, that uh, he is now in the deputy leadership position. So we not, not only have leaders from different states, but from both houses of parliament. That's a really big breakthrough, because if you look at what we've been able to achieve when Adam became the first Greens MP and won the seat of Melbourne, uh, the influence that he's been able to bring resulted in the government releasing about $13 billion for clean green energy and now we're getting action on high-speed rail and a whole number of other projects. So we're really pleased how his work is going. In electoral terms, how do we determine how successful Senator Christine Milne will be as the new leader? Does, for example, uh, she have to make sure that Adam Bant holds his seat in the lower house? Does she need to build on the result, given that I think it's only three senators that are up for re-election at the next half-senate election? What's the, uh, what's the yardstick? Oh, look, I think it's both electorally, but it's also in terms of issues. Christine, uh, this week... But, but let's start electorally if we can, Senator. I mean, what do you think is, is a realistic yardstick electorally for her? Well, like, if you look at the electoral history of the Greens, we've been a national party for 20 years, and in that time our voters increased about 10%. So it has been incremental progress. I'm one, and I'm sure all my colleagues, we'd like the, the increase in our vote to be faster, but it has been steady, and I think that that will continue under Christine. She is an incredibly... So you, you'd expect her to continue to increase the vote, essentially. I mean, the, the Greens don't want to have a perception of going backwards. You had a, a stellar performance at the last election, picking up 13% or so of the vote in the Senate. You'd like to see that happen again? Well, but again, if you actually look at it, it was a fantastic outcome, but if you look at it over those two decades, it has been that steady increase. And so there's many challenges in each election. Christine's clearly up, up to it as our leader, and I'm confident that we'll be able to increase our vote. 
Moving into the policy space, what are you expecting uh, to be the differences between her leadership versus Bob Brown? She's highlighted some things like, for example, trying to engage with regional Australia. Every leader is different, uh, whether there's continuity there or not. What do you think will define her as opposed to what defined Bob Brown? Yes, well, I think time will tell that, but she's got off to a very fast start. On Wednesday, Christine and I will be in Orange for the start of her listening tour in regional areas. And that emphasis that she has given to building alliances and with Adam Bant, and uh, that means that we'll be looking to develop our work with farmers, unionists, community activists, uh, small business people. The potential here to break into new communities is very important both in terms of achieving outcomes, the things that people value and matter, and increasing our vote. We've had a tweet come in saying to ask you about why the ballot numbers weren't released because that's not open and accountable. That's a fair criticism of the Greens, isn't it? It's been growing uh, amongst people and certainly amongst commentators as well. The major parties open up their party room, they tell us what the ballot votes are. The Greens, for a party calling for so much accountability on the major parties, are surprisingly secretive about that. Yes, that was a decision that we took, and I think that that should be respected. Uh, we still are relatively small. There's ten of us. We work together in a very cohesive way. It was a call the party room made, and I think that's, you know, I certainly respect that. But you say you respect it, but do you agree with it? Because you were very well known when you were an MLC in New South Wales uh, for arguing the case for accountability and openness of government and of major parties. I can't imagine, Senator, that you, uh, that you agree with it, even if you respect it. Oh, no, look, I did support it in that instance. I, I did find it a, an interesting challenge. I'll certainly acknowledge that, Peter. And uh, for me, as we grow, we certainly do need to reassess it. But, you know, we're a small, small family of MPs working hard and uh, it's cohesive, our working relationships. So in that context, I do think it was a right decision. There's a comment that was made by Christine Milne shortly after she took over the leadership. It's quoted uh, in a feature article today. She says, quote, The Greens haven't been, I think, successful enough in selling our economic vision. Uh, firstly, do you agree with that? And, and secondly, uh, what would be the ways to change that? I look, at, it's a feedback that a lot of us do get. People ask us, uh, you know, like they might support us up to a point, but then they want to know, can we really trust you with our economy? And we've got excellent policies where they're considerably detailed, but uh, we acknowledge that people don't know enough about them. So I'm really pleased at the emphasis that Christine is giving to that. I think that we will be able to take that forward because she's building that message into her work with communities and it's something that I'm certainly keen to pick up in New South Wales, uh, particularly because of the impact of the resources boom in this state uh, and the negative impact like in the tourism sector, education and manufacturing. I'm, I'm very much aware that I need to be doing more work in this area, so I'm pleased I'll be able to work with Christine on it. Tell me, this is a sort of step back question, if you like. I used to study minor parties in my former life as a political science academic, and, and one of the interesting things is that that bridge between, on the one hand, uh, being a sort of important for, for disaffection amongst voters, a protest alignment, if you like, versus, on the other hand, a party that's trying to grow into an alternative major party, perhaps, one day. Now, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting divide how you go between the two. Where do you think that the Greens sit? Obviously, you can walk and chew gum at the same time, but where do you see the focus should be? Well, I actually think those two things can live together because, to my, my, my mind, what you've just spelled out in terms of the sort of activist lobbying side, you might call it, can also be talked about is representing your constituents. When I'm in the federal parliament, and I saw this in the state parliament, all the parties are regularly seeing representatives from a whole range of groups. Certainly in the case of the Greens, it's obviously more environment groups, people from social justice organisations, from unions. They're more our constituency. And then we take their voice into the parliament, introduce private members' bills, ask the questions, do our job as parliamentarians. So I don't think the divide, I wouldn't describe the divide exactly as you have, Peter. I understand your point, but I think that we are a political party that does our work very effectively in our, in our parliaments. 
There's been some comparisons that have been drawn in some of the writings about the change of leader to the situation that the Democrats were in in the lead up to the 1993 election and, and that relates really to the fact that in that election it was a very polarised electorate. You had a GST contest, Paul Keating versus John Hewson. Now this time it'll be a very polarised electorate in relation to the carbon tax. Now admittedly the Greens are much more in the mix on the carbon tax obviously uh, than the Democrats ever were in relation to the GST in the 93 election but how do you break through and avoid a situation where voters in favour of the carbon tax get behind the Prime Minister and voters opposed to it get behind Tony Abbott and in a sense the Greens get forgotten? Look, uh, what you're identifying is one of our biggest challenges in, the, in elections that are polarised and I think the strength we bring to such election campaigns is our membership and our supporter base. Uh, we get well organised, uh, people are out there representing us, uh, taking the message into their communities and that's what will be really critical here mobilising people, being well organised and reaching out to new communities uh, in areas that are still quite challenging for us. One final question if I can now. I understand that you're not going to buy into this idea of there being some sort of division between uh, the social activist wing and the traditional environmentalist wing and I'm not looking to draw you on that but I am interested in where you think the dominant position lies within the Greens. Are the Australian Greens predominantly an environmental party or are they now predominantly a socially progressive uh, social activist party if you like? Where would you see the dominance? Look, I think it can be both, and that's what we are, Peter. Uh, we obviously... In equal measure, though, do you think? Oh, I think we've got the balance pretty right. I mean, we're there working on the things that matter to people. Um, quality of opportunity, um, more resources for public education, investment in uh, transport services, and we're there for the environment, in protecting our local environment. Look at all the work that's been done uh, on the Murray-Darling River at the moment, on climate change. So I I'm really proud that, of that balance that we've achieved. I have to just ask you one final question if I could. It's slightly tongue-in-cheek. On the contrarians on Friday, I made the point that I agree with the Greens' policy of a sovereign wealth fund. My concern is when you look at the rest of the Greens' policies, there's no money left to put in it. How do you respond to that? Oh, I think you're really missing the mark there, Peter, and you need to go back and look at our policies. Uh, detailed in there is some excellent revenue-raising measures, and now we obviously have the mining tax that should have been uh, um, going after the super profits. But, like, if we close the loopholes like for, on paying parts of the taxation system, particularly on family trusts. I think that would bring in a couple of billion dollars. Uh, there's the issue of company, uh, the company taxes. Our policy sets out that they should go up to 33%. Uh, and then there's a whole number of other changes in the taxation system that would make it fairer to the majority of people, particularly if we get that shift over to the polluting industries. There's lots of revenue there. We just need to ensure that we get that revenue flowing so it's there to work for all communities and for our environment. All right, lots to talk about in that, but we are out of time. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Senator Lee Rianne, and thanks very much for joining us on Late Agenda. Thank you, Peter. We're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, the panel...